So I guess to start the podcast, I suppose I should give you back your nerd card because I t- put a poll out on Twitter asking if you deserved your nerd card back after not knowing or forgetting, I suppose, better accurately worded, that Joss Whedon yes. was the director of the first Avengers movie. And Twitter spoke and they said 41% of them of 63 votes said that you should have the nerd card back. Excellent. I what mean, was the next closest? To keep it from you? Yes. At 32%. So I don't think you won any sweeping victories Well, it's a 9% here. victory. That's a rousing victory. Oh, yeah. Rousing. You should start working for Trump's legal team. I would never because, one, I don't have a law degree. Two, it's Donald Trump. Not, that's neither here nor there. So... What movie are we doing this week? This week, we're doing our very trippy movie, Clockwork Orange. That you chose. I did choose it because I'd never seen it. And it's one of those movies that people, I think, say that they watch without actually having watched it. And I Oh, because you've done it? I Probably. I don't... Probably, which means yes in Tyler Code, in case anyone was wondering. But it's one of those movies that people say that they've seen without actually seeing, and I wanted to actually see it. So... Well, I mean, I've heard of the movie a gazillion times, but literally the only thing I've ever heard is, wow, it's so weird. Like, I never knew anything about it. Like, no plot details, no... I didn't even know that McDowell was in it. I didn't either until I watched... I mean, so I had no frame of reference for that because everyone says that it's weird anytime you ask them about it, but that doesn't really even begin to describe this movie. (laughs) Okay, so what's the movie about? So Clockwork Orange, uh, first off, this is cinematically correct. I'm Tyler. I'm Shay. And it's about a street gang in London in some weird alternate or future universe that... No. No, no, no. It's supposed to be like a timeless dystopia. Uh, It's... Okay, whatever. It still takes place in London with a street gang. Okay. Uh, They go around beating people up and stealing things and raping people and... Just getting into fights and causing all kinds of problems. Just basically ignoring all kinds of laws. All Also social convention in terms of not being a dick. Right. And just fucking things up for the sake of fucking things up. Uh, they uh, are led by this psychopath or sociopath. We still haven't figured out. We'll get into that later. Uh, Alex. And uh, what happens is uh, he rules the gang with an iron fist. And uh, his gang then gets sick of it and uh, frames him or sets him up for murder to get caught by the police and sent to prison. And then basically to get out of prison, he undergoes a treatment that turns him into completely not able to be violent in any way. Aversion therapy. Yeah, it's uh, very Pavlovian in terms of I would rather stay in prison because it was horrible. Uh, with the eyes being forced open and all that, that was just no, 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 no. Uh, and then he gets out of prison, and that's it, basically. That was the longest quick summary I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> all right, we're done with the quick summary. So what were your thoughts on this movie? Because I really was kind okay. of weirded out. Well, so because you don't know how to give quick summaries, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the movie since you just, like, Gave bits and pieces of every part of the movie. But okay. the beginning of the movie, when they're in the, um, what was it called? The Kovlov milk bar? Korovian milk bar? Kro- okay, yeah. First of all, do milk bars exist? Because when I Googled what a milk bar was, it says that it's essentially like an Australian um, word for like deli or quick service place, which is not the impression I got. But they said that they used the milk bar as a way for... Um, them to be able to serve minors in because they gave like drug laced milk. Oh. So because it was milk, they they were able to serve minors. So there was actually a bunch of same name milk bars that popped up around the world. They don't no longer exist from what I can see, but there some popped up in England, one in Canada, like all different places. Really? Same name. That's yeah. kind of weird. I mean, I don't think that they served drug laced milk, but they were called the same name milk bar, and it was supposed to be like hipstery and. Whatever, but do milk bars exist is my my question. I have never been to a milk bar, so I would say no. And did you think it was the vibe of a deli? Because I didn't get that no, vibe. No, was, there was a lot of nude statues for a deli. Well, yeah, they drank the milk out of 
a tit. Yeah, they drank out of a boob. Yeah. Like, that's the dispensing thing, which apparently, according to, uh, or they were just clean on the hour, basically, for those statues that were dispensing milk, because under the studio lights, the milk went bad so fast. Wait, they actually drank milk out of it? Yeah. Like See, that. like, in nowadays movies, they don't actually, like, drink alcohol. They don't actually drink things out of things. No, it's they were like... drinking milk. Yeah, apparently. And they had to scrub that out re- religiously because of the studio lights. Well, I can only imagine. I mean, I work at an ice cream place on the weekends, and just opening the door to our oh. milk thing is the most smelly thing. And we clean that thing all the time. So I can only imagine what it would do in a tiny, close, like, quarter like that. Because the milk thing we have is relatively big, I mean, considering... So. It's also refrigerated and not under Hollywood lights. Right, exactly. So I can't. But anyway, so that part really weirded me out. I didn't realize that it was drug-laced milk until I looked it up later. Yeah. I just thought it was weird that they were drinking milk, and I couldn't really figure out why they were drinking milk. Can we just say that those the, – the conversations were really hard to follow for this movie, for the whole movie. Well, right, but you now know why. Because Well, there's a made-up language, apparently, that they were speaking that is a mix of – Cockney, Russian, and other various things that makes no goddamn sense. Right, called Nadsat. Yeah. That I just... actually brings me to um, a little game I wanted to play with you because you're so smart and I figured I could make you lose your nerd card again. God damn it. So it's I, – I did this so that you would be able to win. So it's called um, Name That Language. So these are all languages that movies made up and – I think you've seen all said movies, so you should be very easily able to match the movie to the language. So I'm going to give you the the movies, and you just need to match the language to it. So the movies are Star Trek, Harry Potter, Lilo and Stitch, Thor the Dark World, and Avatar. I think you've seen all those movies. Okay. You've seen them all, right? Yes, I think so. Okay, that was the plan. So, okay, so for the first one, Parcel Tongue, is it... Star Trek. It's Harry Potter. Okay. Come on. Oh, see, look at that. Good one. Don't look at my list because it has all the answers. I can't see us. I can't see anything in the blanket port right now. Oh well. Oh yes. By the way, thank you to all our podcast friends who recommended a blanket fort for our terrible audio. Although it's quite close quarters, and I don't know if I like Tyler that much. But okay. Uh, Tantalog. So is it Star Trek, Harry Potter, Lilo and Stitch, Thor: The Dark World, or Avatar? Lilo and Stitch. Yep. It is. Um, Navi, Star Trek, Harry Potter. Avatar. Oh, see, look at this. Klingon. That's Star Trek. Come on. Okay, and then Shiva-ish. Uh, well, that's got to be the Thor, Dark Dark. World. Yes, it is. See, look at that. You could do that, but I didn't realize how many movies had made up their own language. You you clearly also missed out on Lord of the Rings because they made up like six different languages because... Well, see, so I think that would have probably fallen into the literature list and I only looked up movies that made up their own language. Fair. I mean, I mean, although this is a book and it was made up for the book, but we're a film podcast, so I just went with films. Okay. Well, I just, J.R. Tolkien was a language professor, I believe, at Oxford in uh, England. And so he just came up with new languages and then wrote a book about it. Mm. Well, you, for this movie, he said he made up, I, I watched this really super old interview, and um, he's um, Burgess, the author, said that he made up the language so that, um, to keep the timeless um, feel of the movie. So, you know, the slang and stuff like that wouldn't um, age out. Right. So okay. he, that's why he did made up his own language. I had, I had heard that he actually thought this was his least favorite piece of writing, but it's now his most famous because of the movie. So it's kind of one of those weird, he is going to have to live with, with his, in his mind, his worst piece of writing is the most famous and everyone knows it. <laughs> At figures. Which is kind of like a, a Twilight Zone, this is my own personal hell <laughs> thing indefinitely because it just, that would be awful. Like, right. Okay, so from the laced milk, we go into, I think the next thing that happened was they like stopped a rape from happening because they like... A gang rape by starting a gang fight. <laughs> right. So they come across a different rival gang doing unspeakable things to a poor woman. And so they just start fighting just because they wanted to fight. Hmm, makes sense. Now, is it that point that we hear singing in the rain or was it not until he fights the woman or the woman and the man in the writer's I think place? it's the first time it was when he's at the house breaking into the writer's house. 
Right. Because that movie, I mean, that movie, that song is now ruined for me. I don't know if it's ruined for you, but it's... Oh, it's ruined for everyone. That's why Gene uh, Kelly, uh, the person who came up with the song, hates this movie and hates everyone related to this movie. I mean, so I read that too, but I mean, the director Kubrick did get the rights to the song. So, I mean, he must have let, let him know what he was using it for, I would assume. He's not going to, you're not just going to give blanket rights. Well, yeah, but at the same time, saying I'm going to use your song in a movie, you can be sneaky in how you phrase it. I mean, this movie is not a normal movie. True. The whole, whole we're going to use your song in this movie. I mean, this is, this goes back to the not ever reading the fine print because clearly they didn't explain to him what this movie was. Oh, maybe. Or maybe that it's just, you know, people are saying Gene Kelly hates it and he really doesn't. Because I just, I feel like you would explain what the movie was about. Well, I just, it, it's amazing that that came about and Stanley Kubrick bought the rights from an ad lib and just a off the cuff only song that the lead character, uh, Malcolm McDowell, could remember uh, to sing while he's beating and raping people. Right. I mean, I find the song interesting because it does to us a, basically a version therapy what happens to Alex in the movie with Beethoven. Because, I mean, now every time I hear Singing in the Rain, I'm going to think of people getting kicked and beaten on the street, just like he thinks of the Nazis when he hears Beethoven the Ninth now. Yeah. I I want to know what the hell was with that costume. What costume? Their, their, their costumes. like that The white whole, thing with the, the diapers? The, the white thing with the diapers, the bowler hat, the... The mascara on one eye or the fake eyelashes on one eye? Yeah, I don't... I mean, I was just assuming it was just more of like a trying to set yourself apart and be different and... I mean, I guess. that di- I don't know why you would wear a diaper. But you said to me... It's, it's not actually a diaper. It's a uh, cricket cup, apparently. And that is also ad-libbed into the mo- and added into the movie because uh, Malcolm McDowell loves cricket and he showed up for... Uh, I guess the fitting for the costume with his cricket gear and the director Stanley Kubrick is like, no, 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 that's part of the costume now. I I mean, that must have been like a nightmare. Like, oh, great. I didn't want to wear my cup anyways, but I have to to protect myself. And now I have to wear it throughout a movie. Awesome. So that's supposedly intended to go underneath pants. Well, which, duh. Yeah, no, people wear it, it outside in, like a... No, diaper. I understand what a cup is for. I've played sports. Thank you. I'm a man. I've worn a cup. I mean, but... wear it outside and make it yellow, and then now we have a Target. So no, that's fine. But that that thing was huge. Like, that cup was enormous. That They're not normally that big. Okay, but so all of the phallic symbols that were in this movie, maybe it was just another... Um, like, a... that's a 20-inch cock cup. Like, that's in a, they're not that big. So it could be one of just another phallic symbol in the movie. Yeah, there were a lot of those, by the way. Just so many. So many. So many. So much nudity for the sake of nudity. I, guess. I mean, that there wasn't a whole lot of advancement to the plot for the majority well, of Well, I nu- mean, when she got cock slapped. <laughs> when she got cock murdered? <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, by the way, just side note, that um, cock that she was murdered with, it is actually, like, you can buy it. It's, like, too grand, but you can buy it. People made replicas. Of course people would make replicas because it's a giant porcelain cock that was in a movie that murdered someone. I, I don't know well, why. Well, and you'd be like you'd be like the talk of the town. Like, why do you have a giant cock on your nightstand? Oh, oh because I'm seeing Cockwork Orange and I'm just so cool and hipstery. Yeah. No, that's just – there's no way I'm buying, let alone buying for $2,000, a giant cock. But oh, – okay. But if it moves the way it did in that movie – I would buy it because I cannot understand the physics of that. How? How? I thought did you were gonna say it moves like that for a completely different, horrifying reason. Oh, you mean for like a little in and out, as yeah. they would say in the movie? Like that thing was terrifying. It, it was basically a fire hydrant. Well, yeah, I'm not okay, but I mean, I've seen, I've been into those kind of stores. I've seen sizes comparable, oh, but God. but but the movement. I'm oh, talking about the movement. How? Even if it rocks, it doesn't rock like that. Well, it's it's oddly counterweighted, I guess. That oddly counterweighted? Like, I it don't... had to have been a magnet in it or something. I... It was driving me I crazy. Don't know, no. There were so many off-putting scenes in this whole movie. Like, things that I can't imagine actors doing or, or putting up with. 
in this in this day and age? Like? Uh, like drinking denture water. Oh, that was so gross. Getting spit in the face. Because you know they had to do that repeatedly for both of those scenes. I mean, the denture water, it's just a, it's a clean pair of dentures that have never been worn, obviously. And it's just water. But still. I it, mean, it's, it's gross, but at the same time, it's not actual denture water. Well, right. Right. The getting spit in the face is actually being spit in the face. Right. It looked like real spit. It was real spit. Yeah, that's... No, no I don't think I would tolerate and that. And Stanley Kubrick's a perfectionist, so that he got spit in the face probably 30, 40 times. He'd probably get desensitized to it. Yeah. So, okay, so since you brought up denture water, can we talk about Deltoid for a minute? Sure. So, first of all, what is his character's deal? Because I think he's, he's a parole officer that's really creepy. That wants to sleep with Alex because that whole scene on the bed where Alex was in the underwear and there was, I don't know what happening. There was definitely sexual advancements there. It was really kind of inappropriate. It was, it was, I think a play on the good touch, bad touch. Like that was definitely bad touch well, from right. a person in power over Alex. That was kind of really uncomfortable. Well, it felt like... Alex almost had some kind of sway over him because he wanted to sleep with him. But then when Alex was arrested, it was almost like the guy did like a 180 and didn't like have any interest in helping him anymore. It was a very weird like dynamic. Well, I had heard that that line in the in the book is not attributed to Deltoid when he says that I hope they torture you, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So I don't know if that changes the character because it was not intended that way in the book i feel like we need to do like a, a like a update episode later after we read, read the book because we did buy the book by the way we have the book it arrived and we're gonna have to both read it because... yeah because there's so many questions but that was one of them to me was just like what what is his deal i i have no earth explanation and then uh can you imagine like how would you sit through that filming scene where your eyes are open with okay, metal you, you jumped i did jump you jumped so basically he gets arrested after being framed for well not framed he he did in fact murder somebody with a someone. penis but all of his friends who were also there participating um hit left him, him the there hit him with... in the face and left him there and, and let the cops find him alone yes so he goes to jail and he basically befriends the minister i don't uh, yeah it's, it's some, some religious um figurehead it's the pastor for the prisoner the the minister for the prison that right does so he manipulates his way into his good graces and decides that he hears about this kind of treatment that will allow you to get out early and so he pretends like he really wants to be good and manipulates his way into actually receiving the, the said treatment and so this is the treatment that you're talking about so explain what the treatment is it's the ludovico treatment or technique Mm -hmm. uh, which, which is uh, they strap you down in the straitjacket, they fill you full of drugs, some random drug that apparently paralyzes you and makes you... I know it's amphetamines and mixed with well, other drugs. It was but... some weird thing. Uh, they secure your eyes open so you can't blink at all, and they make you watch violent movies while you're terrified. Right. And so over time, apparently this conditions you, Pavlovian conditions to not be able to commit any acts of violence because it makes you physically ill. Okay, so the difference between Pavlovian conditioning and aversion therapy would be that Pavlovian is you ring a bell, you get a steak. So it's it's a it's a positive reinforcement. Like you this if Listen. once this thing happens something good's going to happen, so you know, react yes. to the good thing. But this is the opposite of that. Basically yeah. When this thing happens, you're going to feel physically ill. And they did that by inducing drugs into him so that he would feel sick while watching these things that normally would make him either complacent or happy. Do we think this would work on a person like Alex, though? The main character is a sociopath or a psychopath because he dreams about horrible things. I don't know if it would necessarily work on him. Yeah, see, so I'm a little bit unclear of how this would work just because I don't think he has a moral compass. I don't think he has remorse. I don't think... So, I mean, maybe physically his body would obviously get sick because he does have drugs in his system, but I think the what we saw of the, I guess they call it in psychology, the extinction part of it where he's basically desensitized to it after a certain amount of time when the drugs are no longer in his system would happen much quicker with somebody like him because he doesn't have that association. 
He right. doesn't. Well, it's just, it's, I can understand not wanting to be ill, but I also have, I believe I have a moral compass. I mean, I'm not someone who goes out and tortures animals or causes violence for the sake of causing violence. The fact that you're questioning it is a little concerning to me. I'm not sure if I should be in these close quarters with you right now, but okay. But I don't know. I I, I don't know what, because he is a different type of person because he definitely has some cognitive and mental problems. Okay, problems per se. Well, I don't know. If I he think has it's problems. I, well, it's a combination of his home life and who he is biologically. Right. So that so you're leading to the question of is he a psychopath, sociopath, or are they even different? So right. um, I guess we're gonna have to jump to this because we we're here. But so in we did an audience ask segment, and normally I pick like two questions to talk about, but there was a question that led to a pretty interesting debate on our Twitter that we've been trying to figure out. So um, it, basically the guy said, I don't know if this works, but maybe talk about how the hyperviolence was used not for shock value, but for a way to show Alex struggling with psychosis and the extremes. And I do want to talk about the violence, but this question or topic kind of led to a debate between um, the EF words G and Fisher Burton on Twitter. And they, the discussion was around whether or not the character Alex was a psychopath or a um, narcissistic sociopath. So uh, th- basically what they were saying is um, it, he was probably more of a sociopath because he sees right from wrong. Like he, he, he understands what he's doing. But so I was trying to figure out actually what the difference between a psychopath and sociopath is. And honestly, I haven't found much difference, if at all. The closest I found was in Psychology Today, an article stating that psychopaths was the word used back in the 1930s and then as psychology progressed they started moving along to like the sociopath words but now they're actually using the word psychopath again like it's making a a re-emergence but there doesn't seem to be much of a difference so do you know of a difference i well i'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist so i i've always used them interchangeably Uh, i don't know if that's that's probably wrong I just, I have no frame of reference because I just, I consider them basically the same. Well, so you did make a good comment um, when we were discussing this before when you said that um, you thought sociopaths were more high functioning. Yes. More able to exist in reality, which is one of the comments that they were making um, in this debate was that, you know, a a CEO would be, that that murders and kills on the side would be considered a sociopath where... um, Frank Underwood from House of Cards, the president that has murdered people high-functioning sociopath. Right. But so then it gets muddied when I look at somebody like Ted Bundy and I'm like, okay, so you're telling me he's only a sociopath because he was clearly high-functioning. But Um, I'm not comfortable making that assertion. So does it have to do with our own, like, bias on the person? Like, what? where do we use the word? I just don't know. But now it makes me wonder and it's very interesting to me. This is kind of the how many licks does it take to get to the center of Tootsie Bro? We just may never know. Right. Because so no one's going to take the time to explain it or do the experiment to lick the Tootsie Roll or the Tootsie Pop. Well, but if anybody does want to take the time to explain it, I actually genuinely want to know. So cinematicallycorrect at gmail.com. We absolutely want to know. So yes, if anyone it's wants been, to tell us. It's been the source of a heated conversation <laughs> more than once. Right. Um, but before we move away from psychology stuff, I because we're talking about this movie, we can't not talk about. Do you think that a person is can be considered good even though their intentions are still in um impure unpure uh, impure impure Impure, but their body physically won't allow them to do bad things no the the lack of a free will the lack of a an ability to choose poor or make bad decisions in terms of hurting other people and so forth because you're not able to doesn't magically make you a good person Right. I mean, that would be like saying a prisoner who is stuck in jail and can no longer murder is no longer a bad person because he physically is unable to do the things that he wanted to do. Well, I mean, an unrepentant serial killer or someone like that. So someone can feel bad about what they've done and, and progress as a person. Well, true. I mean, you can have genuine remorse for killing someone. Well, and you can also fake genuine remorse. Well, you can. So. Well, but I'm saying actual genuine remorse, not faking genuine genuine remorse. That is different than uh, just not having the ability to 
to hurt other people. Correct. I, I agree with that. Um, so I guess I don't I don't want to end this without at least mentioning this because it's just so interesting to me and I just I'm too obsessed with serial killers. But so Beethoven the Ninth was a big part of this movie. It was at Beethoven was everywhere. Beethoven st- butts busts uh songs he was everywhere right i mean i will pictures be completely honest at the beginning when he kept saying ludwig van i kept thinking to myself i know that why do i know that i don't understand and then i put it together so yeah it was a little delayed reaction but don't worry i got it we got there but anyway so the the concept that music was motivating this psychopath sociopath whatever you want to call him um I found so interesting because I just finished reading um, Helter Skelter by Charles, or by Charles Manson, about Charles Manson. And um, he, the Beatles was extremely motivational for him, obviously, because the name of the book is Helter Skelter, so right. clearly. But um, I just, I read somewhere that the Beatles actually wanted some part of this Clockwork Orange movie. And I just thought it was so interesting because it's this movie came out about two years after the Manson murders, approximately. Well, there's so, definitely a cult vibe to this movie in his treatment of his uh, gang. Definitely. Where, where he will be the benevolent dictator and be nice to you, but then as soon as you cross him, he's going to reestablish Push law and order. Push you into water. And then stab you in the hand. Yeah. Or s- slash you in the hand. Yeah. Uh, so definitely, definitely a cult behavior in terms of the leader of the cult treating his followers that way. Well, in the sex. Uh reinforcement stealing money paying out to the uh, finding women to have sex with right most of the time against their will unfortunately because that's just really uncomfortable uh but yeah i i believe that there was a little bit of there had to be some influence well there, there was a, i think a little bit more cult mania back then because manson had just happened and then it, it was all over the papers and all, all of that we don't we haven't had a real good cult oh real recently. good cult we we went there all right. We haven't right. had a well-known cult. Oh, Scientology? Now we're going to die. <laughs> Thank you. I in no way advocate for making fun of Scientology. They scare the crap out of me. I wasn't making fun of I was just stating. Okay. Uh, but it was just very, very cultish or even Lord of the Flies-ish to start the movie where they are just teenagers doing horrible things with no oversight by parents or government or anything uh i loved uh a couple of the weird things in this like the translation into other languages for this movie uh one of them is the orange from hell (laughs) what uh there's just some random things there's i don't know what that means the translation into other movies orange from hell the title for the movie translated into other languages you did not say the title uh the Clockwork Orange, translated into, I believe it's Serbian or Serbio-Croatian, was The Orange from Hell. Hmm. Uh, I love the fact that this is the movie responsible for Darth Vader, or one of them. Yeah, I mean, he was in a pink shirt, and I really questioned the relationship between him and the writer, and I just, now I look at Darth Vader very differently. Well, so he had actually told Stanley Kubrick before he was carrying the wheelchair that I'm carrying a goddamn wheelchair... Please do this as in many takes or as few takes as possible, because you are known around the industry as a bit of a perfectionist, and I don't want to carry a wheelchair down a staircase with a person in it thirty times. And so they apparently got that scene done in six takes, which he was still dying, but he got his workout in. Yeah, you know, he obviously likes to work out, so I'm sure he was fine with it. Yeah, he was a Mister Universe. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but he, this is the first movie he was in. He was the guy in the Darth Vader costume. And then Stanley Kubrick is also responsible for discovering James Earl Jones. Uh, in not Don- in this movie. Not in this movie. James Earl Jones is not in Clockwork Orange. <laughs> he is in uh, Doctor Strange Love and How I Learned to Love the Bomb or something like that. I don't. There's a. It's the longest movie title ever. Mm-hmm. And uh, so James Earl Jones is in that, and that's his first big break movie. And both of them are Stanley Kubrick films. So. so do we need to title this section, like, Tyler's Fast Facts before the podcast ends? Basically. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm just trying to get as many things in as I can. Okay. Uh, so this movie was actually pulled from the shelves in in England. By Stanley, by Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick's request because he was getting death threats to his family. 
And because uh, there was a copycat um, violence, there was beatings and rapes, and somebody was killed. Yeah, and then and then there was also the singing, singing in, in the, the rape. rain. Yeah, singing in the rape, rape. Singing in the rain, rape. No, they called it singing in the rape. That was the name oh. of the rape. But oh, well. Don't worry, correcting me is your thing. Somebody said that you should be considered an autocorrect, so, yeah. Uh, yes, that was on the roast that we got from the other podcast. Yes, uh, so that's really nice of them. I like Dial M for Movie Podcast, actually, if you want to hear our terrible roast. <laughs> Watered Down Wine uh, was another interesting thing where they, uh, they actually got Malcolm McDowell drunk, or they're trying to avoid him from getting drunk. So in that wine scene where he's drinking wine, they kept pouring water into it. Which accounts for why it looked not like wine at all and looked like juice. I guess just back then they hadn't figured out cranberry juice works just as well as looking like wine. I, I don't know. I just, there were so many weird things. Uh, one of the things, this is one of the first movies where they had the microphones on the actors, I guess. Oh. Uh, so they didn't have like boom microphones or well, anything they, like they, that? Well, it was all recorded live instead of at a sound studio after the fact, so they didn't have to dub anything. And... I mean, good for using new technology, but at the same time, their voices were very loud. Yeah, they were screaming. I mean, granted, I think you have our TV up so high that that probably accounts for a lot of the reason my ears were killing me, but they were also screaming, which made it hard to understand not only them, but also the made-up language that they were speaking. It just, it was very loud and overbearing. Uh, The prison guard especially was just painful. Right. Uh, He sounded like a, a yelling John Cleese. Well, and his stomping. Yeah. Oh, God, his stomping. But so that was a bit much. I mean, the only other thing I wanted to talk about, since you just went through a fast fact section and we went in no particular order, so yes, good for us. Yes, we definitely did not. Good for us. Was that towards the end of the movie, um, Alex is talking with, um, I don't know, is he considered like a governor or what is he He's considered? He's the minister of the interior. Uh, uh, so it's basically a person in charge of all prisons. Okay. Anyways, talking to him um, because they he attempted to commit suicide because he had the Beethoven the Ninth playing over and over, and he was trapped in a room at the writer's house that he had returned to after um, his friends basically attacked him um, after his release from jail. Poor and, screening p- process for the police officers that are now hired that have committed all kinds of crimes. Very poor screening process. But regardless, he returns to the writer's house. The writer figures out that he's responsible for his wife dying. After being brutalized. After being raped. And they claimed it was pneumonia, but he knew it was from results of the rape. So he figures it out, traps him in the room, makes him listen to Beethoven the Ninth over and over again. And Alex basically can't handle it and tries to jump out a window. And well, does jump out a window and <laughs> yes, he definitely does. breaks probably every bone in his body and whatever. So the government is then looked down upon saying that this treatment, this adversion therapy is cruel and unusual and shouldn't be done and whatever. And everyone's on Alex's side, you know, pro Alex. And so the guy comes to kind of make amends and try to persuade him to be on the government side. And while having this conversation, he is feeding Alex food. And Alex is, I can't even, he's chewing like that the whole time to the point where I cannot even listen to what's happening because my misophonia has like kicked in so badly. And I realize that it's a power play on Alex's part, kind of proving like, hey, I can make you do whatever you, I want. You can, you'll feed me even though I'm being a disgusting scoundrel this whole time. But it's so bad that literally I, I, I almost had to turn off the movie. I couldn't take it anymore. Another ad lib scene because they had been on take like 40 at that point because Stanley Kubrick is a perfectionist perfectionist and so Malcolm McDowell just starts doing that to keep everyone's attention because the people are getting bored with the scene and that's the one that they use because that's the one that Stanley Kubrick liked oh well of course because you know it tortured the audience so I mean (laughs) this movie was about torture so here you go thank you very much I've heard that Stanley Kubrick was a bit of a dick at times in in terms of mean-spirited jokes like in this movie, he, uh, Malcolm McDowell doesn't like reptiles or snakes in particular, I guess. And so he, Stanley Kubrick surprised him with a pet snake at the start. Of the movie. Mm. I figured the pet snake was an allusion to him being the devil incarnate. That's kind of what I Well, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt that he also is terrified of snakes, apparently. And you can just do that to be a dick. Right. But I mean, it did make sense for his character. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the difference 
back then versus now, briefly, before we end the podcast, we're almost done, promise, uh, in the, the portrayal of nudity versus violence. And today, the violence wouldn't even register. Well, right, because the gore factor really isn't there. It's very stylized violence. It's very stylized violence, but the nudity would just hit you in the face. Yeah, we really don't have, I mean, unless I'm just like really a prude in the movies I pick, but we really don't have that kind of nudity in movies. I mean, unless you're talking about a porno. Well, no, I mean, at at best, you see a couple pairs of of breasts. You don't ever see anything below the waist. You don't see, which we saw in this movie, you don't see... Well, you don't see it as much. I mean, it was in almost every scene. Yeah, it was throughout the whole movie. There were just naked women. Uh, there was a cavity search at prison, which gross. made it into this movie. I just The nudity was just so over the top. So does that make us as a society now more prudish? Or is it just our um, our likes are more akin to violence rather than sex? Or like what? I think it's more to do with we've been desensitized to the violence aspect of it with current movies because they're over the top and in video games and, and things like that right there's just violence is everywhere and we're just so used to it we're not used to the nudity but how did we get there because i feel like back in the 70s free love and all of that nudity 60s, really pre- okay 60s but early 70s is when this movie came out yes um i feel like with free love and all of that kind of stuff the the nudity wasn't really as shocking or I I think it was the rating agencies in terms of what they were allowing on film because that started to change at that point if I'm not mistaken where they started to go away from but this movie came out with a rating of C from the Roman Catholics um, which meant condemned and then it changed as time went on so Uh, it's it's a very confusing thing it's a, to me. But. It's a very controversial movie. It's it's on a list of – it's always on a list of controversial movies. And it's always on a list of most influential movies and important movies. So it's a good movie, but at, at the same time, it's a divisive movie in terms of that – where there was a lot of nudity. And I think that was the start of the change over to um, less nudity in movies. Really? And, See, now that we're in the age of remakes, I'm really I would be really curious, and not that I would like to see a remake because this movie is perfection and we don't need to ruin perfection, but if somebody were to do one, I'd be curious to see if they went more the violent route or more the nudity route or if they just leveled both out and kind of focused on the the main character and the thriller aspect of things. Like I would be curious to see which way this went. Well, there's no way to make this movie in R. It would have to be NC-17. Like, there's no no studio is going to want to make this movie and make it an R. I, I mean, there are ways. I just, well, you'd have to drastically cut down on the nudity. That's well, right. one of the things that they have tamped down on. And then just, it would be, I, I can't see it being a good movie remake just based on this movie being this movie. Well, right. I mean, this so. is one of those movies that they should leave well enough alone. That's like remaking Star Wars or remaking. I mean,. They well, kind of. They did the prequels. It's not the same. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm Different. sorry. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the, the prequels are not as good as the originals. Let's just be honest. So, all right. Uh, so, rating? Rating the movie, I would say eight, eight and a half. I mean, it's was so far out of anything that I've ever seen before. I don't really know how to categorize it, <laughs> but it's it was a fantastically directed movie. Clearly, uh, Stanley Kubrick is a genius and... Uh, fantastic movie so I'd have to say at least an 8 5 I mean I would give it a 9 just because I I mean I'm fascinated by um, serial killers and all of that kind of thing so the mind of a sociopath or psychopath or whatever you want to call him is fascinating to me so I'd give it a 9 it's well shot and I can't even find anything wrong with the movie um, so anyways next week we are doing Oh, uh, it's your pick, actually. Right. So we're doing I, Tanya because Tanya Harding is actually on Dancing with the Stars this season, which is a four-week season, but she's on it. And Nancy Kerrigan has already been on Dancing with the Stars. So I just recently learned about the whole situation in detail, and I now really kind of want to see the movie to see, you know, her take on it, I guess. Oh, well, that'd be an interesting one. I saw the trailer, and I was not... Looking forward to it until I saw the trailer. Now I, I'm kind of excited to see the movie. So. Well, okay. So. All right. Uh, well, thank you to oh, all our listeners. And I just need to do my 
Thank you to Jake at Athos Music for our intro and outro, and apologize for the fact that we've gone 10 minutes over because of Tyler's Fast Facts. Yes, I'm sorry. My bad. (laughs) Thank you.